What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we're bringing you Block Digest episode 230 at block height 640,734, Saturday, July 25th. So what's shaking today, Janine? Well, as people may have seen, I was reading some free-to-download textbooks that Springer made available until July 30th first or july 29th i can't remember but basically towards the end of the month um and there was a bunch of like e-commerce textbooks and there was like three editions uh and i read them only the parts that reference and let me just say um they were bad <laughs> very very bad uh you know shinobi i i i might be the first person to say this but i think that the secondary education space might be a bit of a scam and be selling overpriced knowledge. Gasp! What? It's all a racket? Yeah, who knew? Well, apparently not students all around. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say this. I It was time for me to apply to the... I applied to one. I didn't get in. And after that point, I gave up on the idea of ever going to university, and I still haven't gone to university. And nothing since I made that decision has convinced me otherwise that I should change that course of action. In fact, it's basically uh, it's basically bolstered my decision to avoid <laughs> wasting money on such institutions. But Janine, if you just fork over a bunch of money for credentials from idiots, doors of opportunity will open for you everywhere. Funnily enough, um, doors of opportunity open anyway when, you know, you just find other ways to learn things, often better ways to learn things, so that maybe when you're a, you know, credentialed professor, you don't write shitty e-commerce books that described Bitcoin as special software powered by a company. Um, I feel pretty good about my position. Sorry, we're going to have to raise the uh, the government mandated minimum credentialing. Um, you don't pass. I don't pass the indoctrination camp. Nope, off to the gulag. Speaking of gulag, I still need to finish that. Yeah, that is a long book. I'm a hundred. Well, no, it's not. It's just I haven't had as much time for reading as before, and I'm also reading multiple books at the same time. Um, it's like it's not even half the length of Game of Thrones, and I read all of those books. Touche. Ah. All righty, though. I think my sleep-addled brain can only put off going into this stuff too long. You want to just get into it? Yep. What's up first? So, um, some big changes um, specked out for the peer-to-peer -peer layer of Lightning by Roast Beef uh, five days ago. And this particular thing, um, it is about time. So, um, currently, as far as the the smart contract structure of a channel state goes and how that interrelates with the peer to peer protocol actually used to negotiate that. Um, you're pretty much locked into a specific type of transaction structure. Um, the minute you open a channel and the peer to peer protocol, um, pretty much locks you into that and you actually have to go close out on chain in order to change that. 
But, you know, as we've seen over the last six months or so, there are a lot of different um, tweaks or variations of pre-signed transactions that can represent a channel state. And as long as you're still pretty much keeping the same participant set and the same UTXO on chain, um, there really is no reason to require you to close a channel out on chain in order to change that. So roast beef is pretty much looking at um, extending the peer to peer protocol so that uh, two participants in a channel can effectively decide to change that channel construct um, on the fly and actually provide any additionary or additional data that's necessary to manage that. Like for instance, the uh, generalized Bitcoin channel um, structure that I went into, I think two episodes ago, um, playing uh, adapter signature tricks so that you can have a much more efficient penalty structure. Um, that would require additional keys or materials transported back and forth um, than just the conventional pre-image that's used right now. And so he's pretty much looking at, you know, extending the messaging types and kind of being able to nest um, additional information like that so that parties can successfully shift the type of channel they're interacting with off chain and kind of keep track of different versions of channel types and the different necessary data required so that let's say you know you shift from a, a conventional channel now to a general channel structure like that that uses adapter signatures and the penalty mechanism that you know that can go smoothly and both sides guarantee that they have all the necessary information to respond to old states, um, given that that whole structure of transactions can change. And I think this is not only awesome just in terms of uh, flexibility of, of the Lightning Protocol in general, but this is a major um, you know, scaling concern that needed to get addressed because really when we get into the territory of all kinds of different types of channels and transaction structures representing them, um, the bigger the lightning network gets, if everybody had to close that out on chain in order to, um, you know, change the type of transaction structures they're using, that would just be absurdly silly given that there's no consensus level need to do that just the peer-to-peer -peer layer didn't support it. So this is something I'm really psyched to hopefully see get into the, the Bolt specification and actually work its way into implementation soon, just because like th this is a lot of flexibility and just it's like that type of scaling problem for Lightning, the only reason it exists is because this wasn't supported in the peer-to-peer -peer layer. And so once this rolls in, like, that is a major uh, artificially created problem just swept off the table. Whee! I know, I'm sorry everybody. Um, I didn't do roast beef any justice by talking in a slow monotone like that. It's just too early for me. You gotta speed it up, get some juice. I don't think that would work. Maybe shock you awake. That's just cruel and unusual. Well, it was supposed to be a lightning pun, but yes. The violation of the Geneva Convention. Alrighty, but uh, I guess next up is a nice drop. Uh, the Eye of Satoshi, an ongoing independent watchtower implementation, has just dropped the first release. Uh... And they've also included a C Lightning plugin and a basic HTTP API for communication with that, as well as a few different Docker images for common architectures. So this is just a very bare bones implementation of the, uh... excuse me, I had to burp the uh, ongoing or uh, in development bolt 13 for watchtowers 
So this is pretty much completely um, altruistic in terms of the incentives. Um, there's no kind of pay for uh, subscription or use uh, features. And pretty much um, it's just got the very basic support in the plugin to register your node with the tower um, with a default of about 10,000 um, state slots per registration. And the registrations last roughly a, a month from the current block height. Um, and it's pretty much just as simple as re-register um, with the tower and that should reset things um, in terms of the expiry time for that. And then just very basic, um, you know, submit a, uh, a state um, to take up one of the registration slots, um, call and check on the tower and um, basic functionality to make sure that, you know, it's still up and has the appropriate state to respond to things. But um you know, this is definitely something to play around with in terms of running your own watchtower. Uh, but I would not really run off um, hooking up your lightning node to somebody else's Eye of Satoshi instance and really depending on that. Um, this is very basic, um, absolutely no monetary incentive. So you're, you're pretty much just blindly trusting whoever is operating this. Um, so personally, I would say, um, if you're not running it yourself, um, I wouldn't put a lot of money in that basket, but <clears throat> you know, this, this is a nice direction to go as far as just having something independent that isn't baked into a more complex uh, piece of software like LND is kind of just rolled uh, very bare bones watchtower functionality into that but that's not as simple to mess around with because it's a larger code base doing a lot more things so not as simple to just pull that away and start customizing or doing weird strange things um, that should be a lot simpler with something like this so I'm actually kind of interested to see what people do with this in terms of hacking on different incentive models or ways to interact with these in a kind of a not running your own type scenario. I have to say that I am not a big fan of the name Eye of Satoshi because, and I, I don't know, it just seems like ev everything that you see in movies or books that is called the eye of usually evil i feel like that's not the best choice of name you know what about goliath or something <laughs> that's also not good but it watches and sees all but it actually doesn't um I mean, I would just go more with the watchtower analogy that you're only seeing stuff in your vicinity. You're not, you know, you have multiple watchtowers. You don't have one all-seeing eye. So I feel like that name is not particularly great. <laughs> so what you're saying is there can only be one watchtower. Also, it makes it sound like Satoshi is some kind of god or or powerful uh, figure. You question the divine status of our lord and god, Satoshi Nakamomo? Nakamomo? Yeah, you know, Mr. Mr. Nakamomo. Well, there is, a, <laughs> there is another kind of watchdog that has recently come down on a Canadian company. Well, what's going on with that, then? So, if you watched episodes 223 and 224, you may re remember that I covered a year-old data breach at the Canadian Coin Square, which had only just been disclosed improperly, in my opinion, last month, after a motherboard reporter um, basically communicated with the person who is alleged to have done either the act or received some of the compromised customer data 
that he was going to, he or she was going to use it. He, she, or they, I think it was they, more than one person, but they were going to use it for sim swapping. And yeah, CoinSquare kind of just kind of ignored that, that sim swapping threat. They just didn't acknowledge it really. Um, well, when there's a lot of smoke, there is also a giant fire because not long after that data breach was finally addressed, kind of, um, a bunch of their emails and Slack messages were leaked. I think it was on sometime around June 12th that this was noticed um, because there was another motherboard article about it and those messages showed evidence of wash trading. And so on July 22nd, just a few days ago, uh, it was reported that the Ontario Securities Commission, OSC, announced recently that it has, quote, settled charges with CoinSquare and its executives after they admitted to having engaged in wash trading. As part of the settlement, CoinSquare CEO Cole Diamond and President Virgil Rostand agreed to resign from their positions and paid penalties of $1 million and $900,000, respectively. Diamond and Rostand have also been banned from acting as registrants and directors for three years, meaning they cannot influence the management of CoinSquare for the said period. CoinSquare's chief compliance officer, Felix Mazur, has also resigned from his position and voluntarily paid $50,000 to the OSC. Mazur has also been banned from acting as a director or officer of a registrant from one year. Additionally, CoinSquare, Diamond, and Rostand will pay a total of $300,000 toward the costs of OSC's investigation efforts per the announcement, uh, which, as we will see, was not that hard given the leaked messages. Um, uh, the regulator said CoinSquare admitted that it engaged in market manipulation by reporting inflated trading volumes between 2018 and 2019. CoinSquare reported around 840,000 wash trades amounting to an estimated 590,000 Bitcoin, currently worth about $5.5 billion. These trades had no economic substance, uh, said the regulator. And so, yeah, CoinSquare's wash trading practice came to light last month when Vice's publication Motherboard wrote a story on the matter after obtaining leaked emails, Slack messages, and other files. Earlier this month, the OSC charged CoinSquare and subsequently settled charges in a hearing on Tuesday. I think this would have been this past Tuesday. Um, for So that was from the block, uh, the report that they did. But for more detail from the motherboard article, here are the leaked messages that indicated wash trading. So in Slack, uh, one day, it doesn't give a date, but Diamond basically asked who had disabled the code for managing internal trades, uh, like the wash trading uh, bot or whatever it was, and uh, an employee replied, me, didn't want to test OSC with it, they added, referring to the Ontario Securities Commission. Uh, and then Diamond replied, but whoever did that took zero steps to ensure that a massive change, how we are viewed externally, would be enormous. Turn it back on, please. And that is the end of the story of CoinSquare. Joy! It's kind of, uh, you know, not a big surprise to anybody who pays attention to the markets uh, in this space. Uh, most of the bucket shops engage in wash trading. And I mean, that's kind of just an open acknowledged thing for the most part. So <laughs> not really a big surprise there. Yeah, I also find it interesting that once again, uh, <laughs> the people who are willing to engage in these practices are also not so great at customer security. And well, also you... do a terrible job at disclosing data breaches. Well, it's generally not smart people that engage in idiotic, shady things like that. Ah, oh, boy. So. This next one. Yeah. Um, I hate it. I'm honestly uh, not sure how I feel about it, but... It is definitely a giant can of worms opening. Um, so the office of the comptroller, I'm sure everybody knows by now, um, has cleared uh, federally chartered banks um, to custody cryptocurrency. And now there's really a lot of factors to this. So first, I want to kind of point out um, 
what this means in terms of a bank custodying things. Now, uh, Naraj from Coin Center is kind of going around claiming that this is no more than the equivalent of a safety deposit box um, where a bank would be custodying um, a specific key or asset for you and it would be limited in the same way that it was with a safety deposit box. Like it would not be considered customer deposits that could be lent out fractionally. But when you look at um, the actual announcement from the office of the comptroller, um, yeah, they specifically say that crypto custody services may extend beyond passively holding keys. So despite, you know, even the, the, the comptroller's announcement is drawing um, most of the comparison to safety deposit boxes, they do kind of leave themselves that wiggle room that it may extend beyond just holding keys. So that said, um, you know, I honestly wouldn't think it would be the worst thing in the world if people could go to their banks and have the equivalent of, you know, a, a multi-sig setup like Unchained Capital or CASA where the institution isn't actually capable of unilaterally spending things, you know, they are just pretty much providing the equivalent of a Bitcoin um, safety deposit box. I don't really think that would be the worst thing in the world, aside from the obvious privacy implications. Um, but, you know, this kind of does open the door that you really walk down this and they get the regulatory okay to start treating this more as deposits on hand um, <laughs> where they simply have a debt to you rather than safeguard something that is clearly your legal property. Um, I'm pretty sure that that is a direction that none of us want to see walked in this space. Um, that's a very bad door that would not only have consequences for people actually using such a service offered by those banks, but would have effects on Bitcoin as a whole, even if you are completely self-custodying it. Like that type of potential dilution of the asset would be a very bad thing. But now, the the last big facet of this is... A lot of financial institutions are legally required to custody any assets under their control with a chartered bank. So this just blows the doors wide open in terms of a lot of financial institutions that literally could not actually own Bitcoin directly. Um, now they can if a federally chartered bank offers a custody service for that. So. Yeah, um, no matter how you slice or dice it or whether you like it or not, um, this is going to create massive waves in this space. And I'm pretty sure this is going to be looked back on as a pretty landmark decision as far as Bitcoin goes. Yeah, I mean, I was expecting something like this to ha happen eventually if I personally don't see myself using it and I think there is a lot of risk um, but I do just want to point out that this decision from the office of the comptroller was reportedly led obviously by the new head which is Brian Brooks who was formerly chief legal officer of Coinbase so you know mm -hmm. there you go you got that revolving door spinning um also congratulated by none other, none other than His Highness uh, Steve Mnuchin, of course, uh, Secretary of Treasury, corrupt banker. Um, but yeah, for anyone who didn't see it, back when Brian Brooks was announced to be, or well, he was announced as having actually taken the seat um, after, a, you know, I think it was like two months or so where it before... Uh, when it was between the period where it was announced that he would become the head and when he actually became the head. But 
Yeah, so around the time that he actually became the head, I pointed out like some an interview that he had done recently, I think it was with American Banker, where he was asked what he thought about people wearing masks in banks. And his response was that he he, you know, stated at the beginning he was not a public health expert, he was not a doctor, but 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 he he says it was probably not a good idea for banks to be allowing people to wear masks in general. And that he thinks, uh, he said, we know a lot more about the risks of public health now than we did two months ago. Let's m- remember that there's a reason that we historically have had policies against wearing masks, masks inside banks. And so what you're going to see, like the, the thing, <laughs> I mean, this, this is a problem regardless of crypto, but... Um, The implication that I saw of him saying that in that interview is that if the mask policy is, or the the anti-mask policy is re-engaged before people who are of significant age feel comfortable to be going into potentially crowded places or even just interacting with anyone face-to-face who isn't their immediate family and has actually, you know, isolated themselves, um... Elderly people are going to be more likely to be reliant on physical banking services and bank branches, and that's going to be the case also with with Bitcoin stuff. They're probably going to be the primary customers who use any kind of service directly at a bank that will custody their their Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies because they're the most scared that they're going to not have enough technical knowledge and fuck it up somehow. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, it's not like they're going to walk into the bank and not be ID'd, so it's not really a privacy thing. It's more like there's going to be people who, besides the Bitcoin and crypto stuff, they're going to be, <laughs> like, I hate the idea that, like, we're if there's any kind of risks to, to their health, there should be no reason why they shouldn't be allowed to walk into a bank to get their own money if they're doing nothing of suspicion like that seems insane to me so the idea like that this guy is just saying yeah we should get rid of that policy even though that we're not actually sure whether it's safe um i don't appreciate that sentiment yeah i mean that pretty much indirectly takes elderly unhealthy people um people with health conditions that put them at risk and um puts banking services out of their reach. Yeah, and I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm not the kind of person that would use those services because the, like, I'm, I've, before I even had any knowledge of Bitcoin or anything, I just, I've always found the idea of giving strangers significance of, like, when I was a kid, I just thought, why would you give a stranger a bunch of your money? That doesn't make sense. And I kind of kept that through most of my life. It's like, I don't know why I would trust these random customer support people or representatives at a bank who I don't know. Why would I give them my money? So when I, when I opened a bank account, I was, like, explicitly saying, like, I'm only going to give you a little bit of money because I don't trust you with my money. And that has, I mean, yes, it, in some ways that's very simplified because it's like, like, how would the global financial system work if people didn't put their money in banks? It's like, I, I don't trust, I don't trust banks with my fiat. Like, I, like, I, I've always kept it to a minimum of what I felt comfortable with losing. So the idea of me giving them my Bitcoin is insane, especially when the whole idea of I mean, well, to some degree, Bitcoin is more about central banking and centralized financial companies, but having monopolies, um, not so much explicitly anti-bank, but still, I find the idea of putting my Bitcoin in a bank to be like, no, especially any major banks, that would never happen. Yeah, I, I feel like really the important thing to do here is just pay attention as banks really build out what they need to offer these types of services and just keep drilling home like bitcoin allows them to be involved in that type of thing or service 
without giving them full control of your money and just keep driving home that unique ability of bitcoins versus other assets so you know at least people are aware that's a thing they can pressure or demand those types of services from their banks you know like that this is gonna happen and i mean <laughs> anybody who thinks that this is something they can stop or wasn't inevitable um you know lull but we can try and push this in a better direction than just banks straight up hold your coins for you. Like, I, I think that on a whole, like if Chase was to offer multi-sig vaults for people, um, there's a lot worse things they could be doing in this space. Well, and also, I mean, when I say that I don't trust my Bitcoin with banks, that also applies to these crypto banks. It's like, you know, at the end of the day, if people are going to need this kinds of these kinds of services, um, would they be better off doing it with a bank who's at least had many, many years, possibly decades of experience actually running a business versus a two, two to maybe five year old me that uh, doesn't have that experience and is mostly just a bunch of tech bros who are high on whatever crypto dust they're smoking. Um, maybe at the end of the day, you know, if you have to choose the lesser of two evils, <laughs> the bank might actually be better because at least, I mean, the thing like a lot of people don't know this or don't realize this when they they keep talking about like oh well you know we have to tolerate coinbase or blah 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 because they buying bitcoin so easy and it's like i mean that's a very relative and narrow perspective because it's only easy for people to open a coinbase account who are already fully banked and would have generally no problem opening a bank account the people, like, I, I'm a documented person, I have a bank account, and I cannot open a Coinbase account because it would require me to get a form of identity documentation that I don't even have right now. I can't open a Coinbase account even if I wanted to. So the whole, this whole narrative about, like, an op building an open financial system is is so dumb. Like, it's, it's a more closed financial system than the banking system that they've built. Um, so... Yeah, it's it might actually be easier and you might actually have more privacy using a custody solution at an actual bank than you would with these tech companies that try to act as banks and just end up having so much like they just end up accumulating all of this compliance debt that in some cases might actually be worse than a bank. Um so I don't know, so you would have to make that comparison, but that might be the case. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be shocked in the slightest, but it's just about, you know, just pushing things in the most optimum direction you can. Like if we can, as a space, meme these banks into more of a vault service where they don't actually ever get control versus just give them your Bitcoin, um, you know, that's a much better direction for things. But yeah, um, so the U.S. is uh, gearing up towards letting banks really get in and play the game. Um, Russia wants to take things in a different direction. So any little details off here, uh, I apologize uh, for Google Translate, but... Um, on the 22nd of July, um, the State Duma in Russia, their legislature, um, adopted a bill um, for digital financial assets um, that's planned to go into effect on January 1st, 2021, um, if it's approved by the Federation Council and signed by Putin. Um, but pretty much. Um, this explicitly clarifies and legalizes um, all mining activity, um, investment activity regarding digital assets. Um, so you are explicitly allowed to mine it, to buy it, 
to own it, to sell it, but it explicitly um, declares it illegal to use as a means of payment. So, you know, on one end, we're opening up our banking system in a way to kind of just let it ease into the space and do everything. Um, Russia is going the, the route that China has. Um, they try, they're pretty much trying to lock it down, weaponize the asset itself in terms of the economic effects that that's going to have geopolitically and let their citizens expose themselves to that. But they're explicitly going, no, 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 when it comes to the ability to transact on something that is censorship resistant. Um, so yeah, um, they're, they're doing the exact same thing that the CCP is. Uh, we want all of the global geopolitical benefits of something like Bitcoin, but under no circumstances do we want our population to have access to a tool that lets them transact when we tell them they shouldn't be. Also the same as wrong. Mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah, I mean, that doesn't surprise me because, um, like, uh, the, the, the textbooks that I mentioned I was reading at the beginning of the show, um, one, one of the things that it repeated in all three editions, I think, was that um, big, a handful of countries have banned Bitcoin and they only listed Russia. It was kind of weird that they said there was a handful and then they only listed one country and the same one every time. Could have also said Ecuador. Um, but yeah, so I don't think anyone was really expecting Russia to be like, yes, we will allow our citizens to have free, decentralized, free as in freedom money. Yeah, but, you know, it's just kind of showing, like, really how dug in bitcoin is getting in terms of geopolitics i mean it's really like every every regime that you could think of opposed to the u.s that is just incredibly totalitarian or repressive domestically it's they're following the exact same blueprint um how can we utilize bitcoin as a way to kind of fuck with the U.S.'s stranglehold on the world financial system, but at the same time, like, you know, no, no, you guys can't be using this to do stuff the government says is bad or, or bypassing government controls because we can't have any of that. Which, I mean, if you think about it, at the end of the day, they're actually, by not allowing their citizens to use it, they're, cut, they're kind of actually undermining their strategy against the U.S. because as a country they would be so much stronger if they were participating in new and innovative financial systems so they're actually cutting themselves uh and undermining their own strategy mm -hmm. but of course the ultimate strategy is not actually to win against the us the strategy is just control like it is for every country yep I think we are probably going to start seeing a lot more um, nation state shenanigans in the space uh, in the next couple of years at this rate. I mean, like if things keep going this uh, this way, we're we're going to be in a really weird world in a couple of years. You know, J.P. Morgan, BTC accounts, <laughs> well. probably more addresses on the OFAC list. <laughs> Well, as I said in my textbook thread, uh, 2017 tired, gover or Bitcoin is not backed by any governments. Then 2020 wired, governments are backing themselves with Bitcoin. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, well. Uh, you want to take us into this next one? Yeah, this one's pretty short it's just something that um i'm going to include in my newsletter but uh the tor project announced i think earlier this month on the 8th or something that they were going to do a one month campaign called more onions por favor to raise awareness about onion sites 
which are websites all over Onion services, um, also called hidden services, that um, use the special use domain .onion because they're only accessible through the Tor network and they protect pre address not only of the visiting user but also the website slash service operator. Um, so you get anonymity both on both sides and. So in their blog post, they said, recently we implemented a way to announce and publicize your Onion site using Onion Location. When a user visits a website that has both Onion services and Onion Location enabled, the browser will display an information pill telling them that there is a more secure version of the website and the user will be asked to opt in to upgrade to the Onion service on their first use. If the user has already opted in for their network security upgrade, they will get directly to the Onion site. Um, that was kind of explained poorly, but basically the way that you do that is you go into your settings and uh, in your Tor browser and you just enable it to, to if there is an Onion site available, you just go to that automatically, kind of like, like how HTTPS Everywhere will, will if HTTPS, uh, a version of the website is available, it will automatically go to that one pref uh, preferred first. Um, so the reason I want to mention, mention this is because, um, I mean, as far as I know, there aren't too many Bitcoin related websites that have an onion service version. Um, but one of the ones that I was most familiar with was blockstream.info because that was, um, as far as I know, I don't know if this was the case, but it was my first experience with a blockchain explorer that also had an onion service version. Um, that might not be the case. That was just my experience. But yeah, so s some of the websites that have already, um, they either already had a hidden service um, and they've enabled Onion Location so that when you go to their website in the Tor browser, you get this little um, block of text in the address bar that says, you know, Onion, um, onion Site Found or something like that. Um, the websites that you can do that with our blockstream.info, mempool.space, uh, the Ronin Dojo website, and also the website for Wasabi Wallet. So those are a few, and I'm hoping that maybe a few more will set up an Onion service if they haven't done it already, but if they already have one, then they can relatively easily enable that to encourage people to go to it. Yeah, this is a really awesome feature, I think, just because, I mean, you know, it's just using um, Tor hidden service addresses is such a pain with how completely not user friendly they are and just kind of baking this type of thing in like a much more user friendly way. Like hopefully um, people actually wind up using this and getting a lot more traffic to the Tor endpoint of any service rather than just kind of funneling through Tor into the clear nut. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. So this next one, um, hold on, I, I feel a sneeze. Oh shit. I'm going to die. I got Corona. All right. So, um, Tage Dryja has dropped a demonstration implementation of UTREXO. So, that for a quick catch up um pretty much just a um accumulator protocol to have commitments to the utxo set um that are completely opt-in and peer-to-peer -peer and done tangentially to the consensus process so that any kind of specialized node that can speak this um can supply inclusion proofs um, to any node running in this way that doesn't have a full UTXO set to prove um, the validity of all the transactions in a block by showing their inputs as validly committed to in this accumulator tracking the UTXO set. And so in this first uh, demonstration implementation, it's pretty much hooking up to a centralized server right now that Tage is running that has the uh, UTXO proofs for the entire chain. And uh, the demonstration client pretty much just connects to the main server, um, downloads that, and ultimately um, gets the equivalent of full validation off of 
a kilobyte or so of data um, rather than having to track. Uh, I think it's last time I looked, it was like three, four gigabytes uh, of space for the entire UTXO site. So he's planning on pretty much building this out um, and integrating UTXO into BTCD, um, the Go uh, Bitcoin implementation client. And they're kind of starting here rather than trying to go into core just to kind of dig through all the complexities of the different validation code and consensus logic that has to get messed with in order to implement this and just kind of see how that goes before actually trying to push something into core itself. And they're also um, working on kind of building out a, uh, a peer to peer layer so that this won't be dependent on a single centralized server. Um, you know, eventually people can start deploying these BTC instance or BTCD instance um, that run UTREXO and build out more of a, a peer to peer network that's actually seeding um, these proofs that are needed to validate things um, using this method. Now, you know, I'm I'm kind of a big fan of this idea just in terms of <clears throat> offering a new mode of validation for different users, but I'm not really the biggest fan of just kind of this solves scaling. So let's try to push things in a direction where everybody is dependent on this because there are kind of weird dynamics here. Like for instance, if, if you lose um, inclusion proofs for your individual UTXOs, um, you're either gonna have to re-generate um, them, so pretty much re-download the necessary parts of the, the chain and recompute those yourself, or go to some other entity and pretty much ask for them and in the process lose some of your privacy. So I think it gets kind of a little nuanced on the the peer-to-peer -peer layer in terms of how things start interacting with each other but you know given given the fact that this is kind of possible and it's not really anything to do with the consensus layer you can't stop it um it's gonna happen but I don't really see this so much as a scaling solution as I do just a new lighter validation mode for anybody who has a really constrained device but isn't so much limited by bandwidth because you are going to see a big bandwidth overhead increase because you need these inclusion proofs for everything you're validating now too um but yeah um this is going to be pretty interesting to watch and uh you know i can't wait until i have a a client that i can actually put on my phone that uses this <laughs> Alrighty. So everybody's starting to get kind of antsy as far as um, when taproot activation. And there's a lot of discussion going on um, in terms of what should we do? BIP9, BIP8, uh, another UASF. Well, um, Anthony well. Towns... It's it's actually not even that simple. It's what kind of BIP eight should we, BIP eight activation should we do? If you look at the list of proposals on the wiki, like a lot of them are BIP eight, but like they're like different kinds, <laughs> different strategies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, mostly Anthony uh, Towns' proposal. Uh, kind of wanted to get into here, but it's. Yeah, it's kind of a weird blurring of BIP9 and BIP8. So pretty much he is proposing a, a two-phase or rather three-phase activation method that would kind of blur 9 and 8 together. Um, and pretty much the idea is that you would have a, a first period um a quiet period and then kind of a, a secondary period after that 
And this could be deployed in two ways. Um, it could be deployed with only the primary period um, being defined, in which case it would effectively operate like uh, BIP9. Um, the primary period um, would set for a year. Uh, miners can activate within that year. And if they don't, then the activation would just simply fail. But, excuse me one second. Okay, so the, the idea is that you could deploy it that way and just function like BIP9, but you could also set and define a quiet period um, during which it would kind of just pause um, the signaling and the activation. Um, the recommendation in the BIP proposal is six months for that period. And then um, pretty much from that point on, um, there would be the secondary period, which would kind of work like BIP 8. So the secondary period would be around, um, you know, a year or so. But the general idea is <clears throat> that this would kind of have the lock-in where it's a guaranteed activation at the end, but also have a reducing threshold where every difficulty period um, you would have a reduction of the percentage of miners that would be required to trigger an early activation. And the key thing here is that the, the definitions for these second periods and the ability to lock it in, um, this should be kind of user configurable. So ultimately, like that would be a flag <clears throat> that the, the user would flip on or off. And so the kind of idea here is blurring all of this together so that you can pretty much deploy it as a BIP9 deployment, a BIP8 deployment, um, but really stretch out the deployment time and give a, a way to fail out and not activate on all sides of things. And the general idea behind the primary period, the quiet period, and then the secondary period is that, you know, the, the general idea is if during the first primary period where it's minor activated, um, it doesn't activate, um, obviously there's a reason, some kind of reason there. And so the whole quiet period would just be for people to take time and assess that, decide whether they want to go through with the secondary period anyway, um, if the reason for the failed activation during the primary was rational or not, or if there was some good reason for a fork not activating in that primary period. The quiet period is a, a big buffer time to you know, decide that and then have users kind of opt out of the secondary period. And so it, it really is like, I don't know. Um, I actually kind of like the proposal just in the sense of it really is kind of stretching out the time period and not being impatient with things and allowing um, for different failure modes. Like it isn't just throw it out there and it's going to turn on for whoever deployed it which is kind of one thing i don't like about bip 8 like once that's kind of thrown out there um backing out of a fork if any problems were discovered becomes kind of a clusterfuck whereas this proposal um you know takes that into consideration and actually has a uh, a method to deal with that I think there is a Bitcoin Core pull request review club meeting coming up on 29th this month. Mm. Pretty sure there is. IRC meeting. Yeah, this is, yeah, my brain's broken. It's too early to start digging for dates and things. I'm just going to assume that your brain that is working better has that correct Alrighty. but yeah um you know so far this is really the best proposal for how to move forward with activations for things in my opinion all right are Tap you root 2x here it comes 
Where's Jeff Garzik? For buggy code. We need some buggy code. This cannot go smoothly. But um all right, though, are we ready for some comedic relief? Yes, comedic relief for Angry Rant. Pretty much. So, um, it has happened. There is now a straight-up um, pump-and-dump, 100% pointless nonsense scam coin on the liquid, or liquid network. And holy shit, is this hilarious. So, do, do, do. yeah, that, that was, um, that was Shinobi's alarm telling him to get up when he normally gets up. Uh -huh. So, <laughs> um, liquid bit, a scarce and privacy focused digital asset living natively on liquid network. What is liquid bit? LiquidBit is the first asset on the Liquid Network with a large user base that is completely independent and not pegged to any other assets or currencies. So, mm. um, trying to do the exact opposite of the entire purpose of that network. Got it. Uh, <laughs> the digital asset utilizes all benefits of the Liquid Network. So, Elbit transactions are secure, fast, privacy-oriented, and cheap. These properties combined with its scarcity and the fair distribution scheme make Elbits an outstanding utility asset. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Is it Ethereum? Mm, no. It's uh, <clears throat> some you weird missed, fair distribution you thing. Meme. Butterfly meme? I'm confused now. You know that meme where it's like, is this a butterfly? And it's not. Uh, <laughs> again my brain is, is is not awake i can't i can't parse things correctly but <laughs> i get it now actually i think it was the opposite the object is a butterfly and he calls it something else so either way meme oh man but um yeah they're they're doing an airdrop um where anybody can claim uh 10,000 elbit uh, just by providing a liquid address. And you can claim an Air additional 15,000 Elbit by completing simple tasks, like sharing the website link on social media networks. <laughs> I'm sorry, but this is, a, this is clearly a scam. It's, it, it's liquid. It can't be an airdrop. That is a completely different state of water. It should be a trickle. <laughs> and, um, hold on. On August 1st, they're doing a pre-sale. Um, and here's the funny thing, too. Their goals, um, three, three long-term goals they want to achieve. A successful and fair distribution. Providing additional liquidity for the liquid network. I have no clue what the fuck that means because they're not providing Bitcoin liquidity, um, dollar liquidity, any... Any meaningful asset that anybody gives a shit about, um, they're not providing any liquidity for. And the third, becoming the base asset of liquid based conversion. Like, no. The base asset of liquid is LBTC, <clears throat> the Bitcoin token that pegged in with Bitcoin. Pegged to Bitcoin. That's the, that's, that's the base of that. And despite the fact that you could theoretically um, include other base assets that could be used to pay fees, um, the Federation is going to have to kind of opt into and fork that into things. So yeah, even if there does wind up being other base assets on the Liquid Network, this shit coin ain't going to be fucking one of them. <laughs> but it's like, this is... This is the most like absurd thing ever. And I'm I'm cringing inside thinking about clueless idiots on Telegram who are going to get scammed by this. But it's like it it's just like this is it was a matter of time. I mean, anything that you can just issue arbitrary tokens on, um, people are going to run these kinds of scams with them. It is inevitable. But this is just like so cringy and and hilarious. Like the the core goals of this are instantaneously um, 
provable as nonsense. You just explain how liquid works. Like that. That's <laughs> this is such a fucking joke. <sighs> yep. But it's here. When, when Coinbase. <laughs> oh my god. This this is how we get Coinbase on Liquid. Just meme them into um, supporting this, and then, bam, they'll have Liquid support. <laughs> put, put, put their due diligence team on it. <laughs> I'm sure they'll see no problems with it. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, I think that's a a good segue into the the last of the day and the angry rant. Yep. So uh, Peter McCormick interviewed Brian Armstrong. I'm pretty sure this is one of, I mean, this is the first time I've heard him on a podcast before. I don't know if he used to do them before he became, you know, higher than thou, uh, mighty Silicon Valley CEO. But um, the episode was just released yesterday. Um, and I knew about it in advance because uh provided a bunch of background on Neutrino and Hacking Team and also the recent deals with Coinbase Analytics being offered to the IRS and the DEA and the Secret Service. Um, and so I mostly cared about that section of the interview, um, which didn't start until about an hour and 10 minutes in. But um, I mean, the rest of you may care to know one significant thing that was said in the first half of the interview that Brian basically admitted to being wrong about Segwit2x. Uh, so yeah, he did that. During the discussion about Coinbase Analytics and their contracts with the IRS, Secret Service, and potentially DEA, at first Brian restated his line about wanting to recoup costs, including tax money that they've had to pay, kind of like the arguments that we highlighted in episode 228 about why various CEOs of companies took advantage of PPP loans, because I want to get my tax money back, okay. Uh, then Peter pointed out that Coinbase makes more than enough money to cover the costs of acquiring and running the analytics platform. So Brian switched to the, we want to build a good relationship with law enforcement so that they're not as mean to us anymore argument. And he presented Coinbase Analytics as a way to protect customer privacy because supposedly offering this to the IRS and the Secret Service and potentially the DEA will give them leverage to deny or minimize requests for information about their customers, even in instances where they have the legal right to deny such requests. But for some reason they feel beholden to these people to give them what they want uh so this is basically just kissing up to them to have a good relationship and then around an hour and 30 minutes in he talks about the circumstances of the neutrino acquisition he says was handled by coinbase's corporate development uh merger and acquisition team he claims to have not been involved or even met any of the people involved until after the acquisition and he said that most of the diligence that was performed was, quote, on the technology itself and the engineers that we would get. Um, um, it is okay. I mean, one of the hacking team people was an act, at least one of them was an actual engineer. And in fact, on his LinkedIn profile, he said that he was a senior software engineer at Coinbase between February 2019 and July. July 2019. So the whole line that Brian gave us about how people were being transitioned out of the company, yeah, that took place over several months, just as we predicted. Um, and then he says that they failed to do due diligence around the values of the values of the company and company culture and whether they were a good fit for that. And he states that he didn't realize we may have hired some black hats here or at least gray hats until after the acquisition and after a number of people, including myself, pointed it out to them. Of course, he doesn't give anyone credit for this. We're just referred to as the angry people on Twitter. No thank you for providing the due diligence that your million dollar team of dozens of people 
should have done. No thank you for protecting your customers from what you now refer to as black hats. Uh, he then goes into uh, a bit more detail about the process of firing them and describes it as a tough decision because you don't fire someone just because someone's angry on Twitter and they should be engaged in an exit agreement that was win-win. Those were his words. And what annoys me the most is that he said that the lesson learned from this whole thing is that they need to engage in additional diligence regarding reputational risk. And this is probably one of the most damning statements of the whole interview because reputational risk was a risk, but it was not the biggest risk here. The fact that they hired former hacking team management and God knows who else, like we, as far as we know, uh, it was John Collar Russo, Alberto Ornaghi, um, Valeri, I can't remember his first name, and then Luca Guerra, who Luca Guerra was actually a software engineer, and there are emails of him doing questionable things in what was released uh, by uh, Phineas Fisher and WikiLeaks. 2015. So I would not, uh, Brian, that there were some less culpable people at the company that they kept. Who knows if he was considered one of those less culpable people because he wasn't part of upper management, but that is entirely possible. Um, anyway, yeah, so they, they hired former hacking team upper management and who knows who else. Um, and they didn't see that as a security risk until it was pointed out to them by outsiders. Um, that should have been a wake-up call. The fact that people outside of your company saw security risks to your business better than you did. And yeah, your reputation once again took a hit. Your reputation took a hit because you were extremely loose hiring practices and these were not unknown actors who had like changed their names or put extensive resources into hiding their history. Their names were all out there. Anyone with any real awareness of the information security space, which hopefully there is someone at Coinbase who has that knowledge uh, in the last 10 to 15 years, would have probably recognized their names without even going to Google or DuckDuckGo or whatever search engine you use. Um, because it's pretty obvious. Like, I recognized their names immediately when I actually saw them. Like, the Neutrino announcement that Coinbase gave is like, welcome to the family. But they didn't say who worked at Neutrino. And then when someone else actually pointed out who was at Neutrino, I recognized their names instantly because I actually pay attention. <laughs> and Giancarlo Russo, the, the reason someone even noticed is because Giancarlo Russo, former, I think he was former CTO of Hacking Team, and then he was the CEO of Neutrino. Like, he had Hacking Team on his LinkedIn profile. Like, it wasn't a big mystery. You, you they, Someone would have seen it. And I don't... I don't know, because like if I'm if I'm at a big tech company and I come across someone's LinkedIn or resume, I mean, I assume that they were asked to provide resumes as part of being acquired, maybe. But if I'm looking at someone's resume and it says that they were a CTO or whatever kind of executive at a company called Hacking Team, even if I know nothing whatsoever about Hacking Team, I'd be like, Hacking Team. That is an interesting name. I should probably look them up because, you know, it has the word hacking in it. Like, I don't know how dumb you have to be to to miss this. Yeah. I just kind of skipped towards the end um, to listen to a little bit of the Neutrino stuff. I haven't had the time to listen to the whole thing yet, but it just seems like... Um, most of Brian's responses were just canned bullshit. And um, that, that that's pretty much all Peter was able to get out of him. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I I don't think that. Like, yes, could he have pressed him more? Could he have called out the bullshit more? Yes, but on the other hand, I don't think that that would have necessarily. I don't think Brian would have said anything or revealed anything more than what he said. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I also fundamentally, like, he made this argument. He, he kind of implied that they didn't know who they were, and he said that before also in the piece where it's like, transitioning them out. He's kind of, in, there's been multiple instances where they kind of implied, like, oh, we missed this. We didn't know who they were. And I fundamentally... Like, besides the fact that I just called their due diligence team stupid, if it is true that they missed this, I don't think they did. Because in the, um, when they were giving out press statements initially when Delete Coinbase took off, their statement implied that they knew who they were and they said, we don't condone the actions of hacking team. And it's like, what are you talking about? So wait, you don't know who they are, but you know that they've done something bad enough that you don't condone it so you know who they are and maybe i don't know guess you figured it out too late or whatever but at some point they knew and they didn't think it was a risk until until they they didn't see the security risk they didn't think it was maybe a bad idea to have hacking team people have any any degree of involvement with their company potentially having access to customer information they didn't see that as a risk but oh god the reputational risk of them being now associated with with us because angry people on Twitter. Um, And also around an hour and 38 minutes in, um, for anyone who wants to know the timestamps of like when this particular part of the conversation took place, um, I think I've already said some of them, but also I made a tweet that points to those specific timestamps. But at about an hour and 38 minutes in, he refused to confirm who from hacking team that then became Neutrino uh, was transitioned out um, before it was morphed into Coinbase Analytics. And he said that this was due to privacy and respect for these individual people. Exact words. He said he had he was respecting their privacy. I just thought, seriously, what, what have these people done to deserve that kind of elevated respect? Because it is elevated. Like when like and he also kind of he apo- like he implied that it was their fault for i mean it is their fault for not doing enough due diligence and doing the the acquisition anyway or whatever um but it's also their fault for not coming clean about who they were and the fact that they knew they they goddamn well knew that if people found out that connection that they were former hacking team if they noticed that they were going to create trouble for coinbase we know that because the whole reason neutrino exists is because hacking team's reputation was trashed because of their actions and who they chose to associate with and the people they trained to surveil and murder journalists like jamal Khashoggi. like it's on them too if you're if you're coming into a company and you're a toxic asset to them if you don't disclose that if you're not upfront with them it's not necessarily it's not their fault <laughs> for breaking off an agreement with you because you did not you were not clear with them it's also on them but also like this whole argument like we should respect their privacy or whatever it's like where is your respect for your customers privacy Where's your respect for your customer safety that you almost put in jeopardy by hiring these people? Where is the respect for the people whose privacy they violated much more invasively? um, And you've given them already millions of dollars. They're going to walk away and be able to support themselves for quite a while with that money. Do you think years from now, anyone is going to interpret this decision to not name names as we respected their privacy. This is an example of good company culture and not you trying to cover up a giant fuck up. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, yeah, no matter how you try to slice it, like you are either incompetent, you were lying, um, you were downplaying something you were aware of. It's like there, there is no way out of egg on the face, no matter how you try and interpret the situation. Yeah, and like I said, hacking team reputation is already trashed. Like these people cannot, can they? They cannot go much lower in terms of their that that association will, should and will follow them for the rest of their life. Whether they do anything to make up for that is another thing. Like I'm not saying like I wasn't actually because he was saying oh people were calling for them to be fired and it's like. Well, I would prefer to be fired, but I actually never said that they should be fired. 
I, and I've also never said that I think they shouldn't get a job anywhere. They can get it. I'm not, I'm not saying we have to like cut them off from being able to live. I'm just saying, wouldn't it be a better idea if maybe people who are dealing with, you know, sensitive customer information, you should probably not hire these people. And maybe you should suggest to them, you know what, a better position for you to make up for the things that you've done in the past, you know, be a janitor, be be in some position where, you know, make make money to support yourself and whatever family you have, but don't, don't, you're not going to be in positions where you can hurt people again. Like that, you don't deserve that. Uh, you need to earn that back and you have, they haven't done anything to do that. They've just tried to, to slowly skate their way out of it. Like by, by him saying like, he's going to respect their privacy simultaneously. He's saying that customers who are concerned about the fact that some of these people from hacking team might still be involved in the company don't deserve to feel safe. Like these people deserve privacy, which actually ended up being not worth very much anyway, because like one of them actually listed his transition out date on his LinkedIn profile. So we know one of them when he supposedly left, unless it's possibly a lie, but it's like, you're, you're just telling your customers that your, your, your sense of safety is less important to me than protecting these guys' names. Yep. Ah, oh, boy. Well, I mean, it's not like Brian was going to come on and actually do anything, but, uh, you know, brand damage control. So, yeah, I'm kind of out of anything to say on that, though. Um, I want to move along into final thoughts, or you got anything else you want to add? Nope, and that's uh that's just about it. Can't stop talking about Coinbase. Yep. Oh yeah. And that and then they're going to IPO cuz you know that's going to go smoothly. We'll see. What we got in terms of final thoughts though. Um don't really have much at the moment. I just found it funny. Something I saw today was that there is now a mod for Minecraft to insert a Windows 95 desktop into Minecraft. And it looks pretty funny. That's weird. <laughs> because, yes, we definitely want to use an outdated version of Windows in Minecraft. Why not? Although, to be fair, the um, graphics quality fits Minecraft's aesthetic perfectly. Yeah. I guess, uh, I don't know, my final thought is, uh, yeah, this is uh, a weird situation developing between the U.S. and China right now. Uh, if anybody's been paying attention to the consulate in Houston, um, the U.S. evicted them. Um, the CCP has now done that tat for tat with our consulate in Chengdu. And uh, the U.S. has actually sent federal officials into the old consulate building in Houston. And now, um, yeah, a lot, a lot of things are happening really fast without any kind of clear citation or evidence, um, such as claims I'm inclined to believe that the CCP was directly involved in helping fund and coordinate um, BLM and Antifa riots um, out of the Houston consulate. As well, um, you know, when that building was taken in, um, there was a CCP official arrested who was in the consulate at uh, San Francisco hiding um, from a federal arrest warrant. So, um, yeah, pretty much right now, um, we we are in an intelligence war uh, with China, and that aspect of it, at least, is starting to get hot. So, yeah, this is going to be a uh, fun rest of the fucking summer to see how that shit all plays out. <laughs> Speaking of intelligence wars, um, ICE has since clarified that if you're a foreign exchange student in the United States, um, 
and you have a student visa to be studying here and your university will not be offering um, any physical in-person classes as of the next year, uh, your visa status will no longer be valid and you will be kicked out of the country because online school is not real and recognized by the government if you're an immigrant, apparently. So another reason to think that the educational system and the border system is a scam. I thought that that um, had an injunction placed on it and then they ended up walking that back. It's possible, but as of, I think, last night, I saw a clarification from ICE that said that's what they're going to do. But hopefully, maybe not. Maybe some people aren't so unintelligent to do that to thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. Well, I, I honestly don't know how I feel about that, because my read on that situation was just... Um, get them out of the country because there are absolutely um, people here on student visas who are, you know, foreign government actors. And um, that's a really big pile of hay to sort through to find the needles. So well, then sort the hay according to those allegations and don't injure a bunch of innocent students ability to continue their education that they've paid tens of thousands of dollars for. It's kind of what I mean when I, I said we're in an intelligence war. Like, that's... Shit's not going to fucking go how it should, ideally. Bring the leaf blowers. Mm -hmm. But on that note, punks, uh, I think that's all for the day, and we will catch you later. Adios. Bye. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>